I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guest today is Jamie Roars, an art historian who completed her bachelor's and master's degrees from University of Plymouth and Birkbeck University of London, respectively. Her area of research is the history of Vienna from the late 19th and early 20th century. She has worked at the Freud Museum, the final home of Sigmund and Anna Freud, in London for the last seven years, where she is now the events manager. Alongside this role, she has researched and produced content for exhibitions, events, conferences, and educational resources, all of which are now taking place online. She has published and delivered talks on the history of Vienna, psychoanalysis, and surrealism in art, design, and film, and recently appeared in the documentary Art and Mind. Her first co-edited book, Freud Lynch, Behind the Curtain, based on a conference from 2018, is due for release this year. Please visit the Freud Museum London online at freud.org.uk and visit their shop as well as the What's On section, which shows the variety of courses and lectures available both live stream and on demand. Proceeds go to benefit the Freud Museum London and are helping keeping it running while its doors have to be closed during the pandemic. Rendering Unconscious is also at YouTube. If you'd rather watch this discussion instead of just listen, just search for Rendering Unconscious Podcast at YouTube. We're hosted on Trapart Films' YouTube channel. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. From Trapart Books, 2019. For more, please visit our publisher's website, trapart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash V-A-N-E-S-S-A two three C-A-R-L. Your support is greatly appreciated. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. Be great. Well, let's just start then with how you ended up working at the Freud Museum. Okay. Um, I, I actually studied art history at university. I did my, my BA in Plymouth. Um, and uh, when I was there, I sort of took a, um, a liking to the history of Vienna. And when um, I came to London, I was going to, I was going to study my master's, um, also focusing on the sort of history of Vienna and art from, from this time period. Um, from sort of Freud's time period. And uh, I decided that I just wanted to immerse myself in the whole um, context of, of this moment in history. And um, two days after I moved to London, I had an interview just to volunteer in the shop at the Freud Museum. Um, and and I, I got it, and uh, and I've been there for now for seven years. <laughs> so it was a pretty good opportunity. <laughs> I continued to volunteer there when uh, just in the in the shop um, when I was doing my masters, and then so when I finished, I got a little bit more responsibility, and the role began to grow. Um, initially just in the shop, but uh, I say just in the shop. Uh, the shop was an amazing starting point because you got to really meet the demographic and types of people that came to the Freud Museum. 
um, and the 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 sorts of interests that your audience have and different range of backgrounds and I think I learned a lot from that and and it eventually became really useful when I started to do events at the Freud Museum as well um, when I started to run some events um, to to have that background in knowing what people were interested in um, and also their their own background so we actually it was um, an interesting car start because I didn't expect the um, international reach like I kind of thought maybe British and maybe Germanic um, audiences would be coming to the museum you know for being from Austria I thought that it would appeal to an, uh, a sort of Austrian Germanic audience but actually I'd say every other person coming to the museum was South American <laughs> and I think when I started I probably couldn't even pick out the Brazilian the Portuguese language um, in a lineup but um, I think now I can actually have a, a small conversation as a result of people that that have come through the door that's so cool no yeah psychoanalysis is really huge in South America especially like in Brazil and Argentina and I often think about like growing up or being in a culture that like psychoanalytic thinking is like widely accepted as like the way to think about mental health it must be amazing exactly and I, I've always wondered sort of why why that is the case like why uh, Latin America had really taken to um, to psychoanalysis and it you know there's that sort of historical link where a lot of refugees who were leaving sort of Central Europe during the Second World War, a lot of them went to um, the southern tip of the continent, um, thinking of like Stefan Zweig, who um, was a, a, a contemporary of Sigmund Freud and so on, um, not an analyst, but, but uh, um, it very much um, is drawn to this wanting to know more about oneself. Um, I've started to know, I've started to um, get very well acquainted with uh, some people over in Chile now as well, the University of Chile, um, who recently had an online event at the Freud Museum uh, on the history of psychoanalysis in Latin America. And it was, it's, it's a fantastic sort of journey um, to, to see how psychoanalysis really was embraced, but then also um, almost manipulated uh, to um, change people's mindset. So it was psychoanalysis became from from my understanding from this from this talk that my colleague at the University of Chile, uh, Mariano Rupertus, um, he sort of mentions how particularly the sort of religious leaders and the, um, uh, the sort of political uh, figures in uh, Latin America manipulated psychoanalytic thinking to um, convince and to um, uh, almost distort the population's um, perspectives and views. It, I'll, I'll make that one on demand, but it's a, it's an incredible talk, <laughs> but in, given both in English and in Spanish as well. That's fantastic. Yeah, I was just going to ask you if that was one that was on, available on demand because I haven't seen that and I must now. <laughs> please do, please do. <laughs> I will. Yeah, Patricia Giarovici, who also was, just gave a talk at the Freud Museum as one of your events, um, she's from Argentina and she wrote a paper that's included in this book I edited with Manya Stanko Lawrence psychoanalysis and violence and um, she talks about like the history of psychoanalysis kind of alongside the different revolutions and and how it's kind of part of the revolutionary spirit where like the population doesn't accept these like dictators and they're constantly like revolting and uh, there's constant upheaval and they're trying to subvert the norms that are trying to be implemented upon them and she thinks that might be one of the reasons why psychoanalysis has really taken root there as this kind of political and social movement more than it has like say in North America. That's exactly it. I think Mariano kind of touches on this as well. And and also, um, I, 
I suppose in his talk as well, he also includes the um, the importance or the the history of of race in South America um, and its relationship with psychoanalysis. And one of the most prominent earliest uh, Brazilian psychoanalysts was, um, in fact, a, a, a black Brazilian um, uh, analyst um, who's, you know, often maybe not talked about, I think, in Western culture, but probably should be something we should revise. So might see if that's something we could um, explore or ask someone, uh, ask Mariana to kind of give a follow up talk on because it's it's um, it's otherwise forgotten in the canon of um, Western psychoanalytic uh, teaching. Yeah, that's great. That would be great. Um... Yeah, and I've said to you, I think that the one of the only good things that has come out of the pandemic is the fact that the Freud Museum has all these online events now. <laughs> it's good for me being in Stockholm since I've left uh, America, North America, U the United States of America, I should say. Um, since I left there and came to Stockholm, I don't really have an analytic community here. So it's been great for me to be able to kind of go to all these lectures and like keep that part of my psychoanalytic practice and identity alive through all of these online events. I'm really glad you've been enjoying them. I'm really pleased to hear that. And, um, you know, I was sort of reflecting on where it started uh, the other day and and how it started our very first one, our very first course came out three weeks after um, UK went into lockdown. <laughs> And that was with uh, the wonderful Mary Wilde, who you, I'm sure, I know that you know. <laughs> and um, it was on the psychoanalytic investigation of the Joker. And, um, and you know, she's been such a, a valuable um, person to be um, working with in this pandemic. She shifted so quickly to this online format and um, has just producing content that's just brilliant i mean the most recent one was on um the the music videos and filmography of david bowie which i then got a, a feedback comment that said you really missed the boat there you should have called it sound and vision and <laughs> we should have <laughs> we should have made a pun on that title but um Yes, uh, the film and psychoanalysis courses have been um, a wonderful thing to be getting involved with. I think also because they've been in, they've been sort of a light-hearted um, uh, sort of subject to to um, be spending time on um, devoting time on. Um, but also, you know, we also have these uh, introductory courses with Keith Barrett on on um, uh, Freud's theories, but also on uh, psychoanalysis that came after Freud and on philosophy and Freud. So, you know, with those two, just sort of as a base, as a kind of example of the the range of things that we have, um, it's been it's been a whirlwind of a ten of the last ten months, um, to 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 say the least. You know, we adapted really quickly. I think. Um, and it's been really fun. It's been really fun. Yeah. And yeah, exactly. With Mary's courses, not only are the courses entertaining and informative, but then I have all this kind of like homework of like what films to watch. And of course, everybody's saying also with this pandemic and everyone being home, people are watching a lot more film. So instead of just watching like whatever pops up on Netflix, it's like, okay, I go search for these films that are actually kind of film cinema history they have some sort of context and sometimes they don't sometimes they're just fun but either way um I like all the films that Mary's recommended and it's kind of given me a cinematic uh education at the same time yeah she did this um this this brilliant course back in the summer on uh the psychology behind documentary films, which I really enjoyed because you ended up going on all the sort of different platforms like Mubi, Netflix, whatever. And they were, these films were so available to access in advance and after the course. And it just, you know, everybody was delving into documentaries in the summer. It was the perfect subject to be um, indulging in. Yeah, and this recent one on cults, I, I've been watching a lot of things about cults, too. I think a lot of people have as well, <laughs> the whole, like, 
uh, cult mentality of the American far right. So, yeah, it was nice to be able to watch all these cult films as well and then hear Mary be brilliant about it. And these kinds of courses are helping the Freud Museum kind of stay afloat during being closed, yeah? Yeah, the so the Freud Museum has is an entirely private charity. We don't get any government funding and it's sort of up to us how we um, create that revenue to keep Freud's house alive. And I don't know if you've, I don't know if your listeners have been to the Freud Museum, but the Freud Museum in London is where the um, famous psychoanalytic couch resides. This is the final home where Freud and Anna Freud, his daughter, lived. Uh, Freud on, for, Sigmund Freud actually only lived there for one year from 1938 to 1939. Um, and he died in, in the house in 1939 um, after a uh, battling cancer for many years, cancer of the jaw, um, from all those cigarettes that he famously smoked. And um, in this house, uh, as I said, we have the famous psychoanalytic couch and his incredible study um, with his desk and antiquities sort of preserved in almost exactly the same places that he had left them in 1939 when he died. Because um, when his daughter Anna continued to live there until her death in 1982. She kept that space um, almost exactly as he left it. And in her final will and testament, she um, wished for the museum to be, for the house to be turned into a museum in honor of her father. Um, so this is why it's so um, uh, well uh, preserved in this way. Um, and of course, there's also two other Freud museums. There's one in uh, in what is now the Czech Republic, which is where Freud was born. And there's also the Sigmund Freud Museum in Vienna, um, which is, is where he lived most of his life um, on, Bergas, on the Bergasa in, in, in Vienna. Um, but whilst the museum is closed we're obviously not able to charge entry which is what we typically um, make our sort of the the day-to-day the -day, uh, um, ends meet um, so in this time we've had to kind of rely on or turn to digital platforms to be our uh, alternative um, revenue just to kind of keep things going and to make sure that we're still there at the end of the pandemic. Um, we, we obviously have been running uh, talks, courses, conferences, all online, um, but also our online shop has been uh, a saving grace uh, and, and has an incredible um, collection of both wonderful literature and, and um, uh, the most recent releases on, on writings and psychoanalysis, as well as Freud's own writings, but also just some really funny stuff, <laughs> including Freudian slippers. I, c I couldn't resist plugging that. <laughs> I have Freudian slippers. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> I have the Freud action figure too. <gasps> That's limited edition. That's just not even sold anymore. <laughs> no? Oh, wow. Cool. And I have... People have gotten me like gifts over the years. Like I have a Pink Freud T-shirt and like a Pink <laughs> Freud mug that says like the other side of your mom or something. <laughs> so, like, it's great. I love Freud memes. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's a. Uh, it's been a. It's been an incredible. Um, well, ten months, but also. Um, very much missing the sort of si being in situ at the museum. That being said, we are able to reach like just uh, people that we never would have been able to invite into the museum. Our capacity there for events was something like 80 and now we can, now there are no borders. Now anybody can join, anybody can listen and take part. And I'm so pleased that we've been able to, to, um, get it running and and to meet so many new people like you Vanessa I honestly I I didn't I hadn't met you before um, and I'm really pleased that we've had the opportunity to at least online and cross paths so many times 
Yeah, exactly. And I hope that you guys keep doing the online courses even after the museum's like open regularly. So the rest of us can enjoy it from afar. I actually have never been to any of the Freud museums. Have you been to all of them? I haven't been to the one in Czech Republic. Um, but I've been to the one in Vienna, which um, I believe has just opened. They they reopened. Sorry, they um they had a, a renovation um, the last few years or the last year, and they reopened around the time of Freud's uh, death day, the sort of death anniversary on the 23rd of September last year. Um, and uh, I don't know if anybody listened, but Jacqueline Rose gave an incredible lecture for them at that time called to die one's own death which is also available in print from the london review of books um a really sort of emotional and moving uh memorial lecture oh that's great i'll have to check that out i will link to all of these things so that people can find the events at the Freud museum the shop at the Freud museum this lecture by jacqueline rose that would be fantastic um i've decided once borders are open and travel is safe and everything that's like the first place I'm going to go is to Vienna because I need to make my pilgrimage (laughs) we have to do these things when we can you know have you been to Vienna before no it's the greatest city in the world (laughs) yeah we'll say more about it you studied it and it's art and it's history yes I, I I think one of the toughest things about the the pandemic has been being stuck in the same spot in London for 10 months or actually I've, I haven't left in a year um, and I, I really miss a sort of annual visit to Vienna because the city just sort of exudes culture um, you've got some of the great well, in my opinion some of the greatest museums in the world and um, all within walking distance of one another the Sigmund Freud Museum is of course a must uh, to visit Um, they have done a really good job you know considering that actually the Freud Museum in London has houses the most of of Freud's own uh, collection so Freud was an avid collector of antiquities uh, from Greek uh, Grecian antiquities Roman antiquities um, Far East Asian and African and Egyptian antiquities and 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 uh, have all of his furniture and so on. The one the Freud Museum in Vienna has done a really good job of sort of making the story come alive um, in a different way. Um, Anna Freud, in her final will, you know, obviously wanted the collection to remain in London, and they have a, a very um, uh, tainted re- she had a very tainted relationship with Vienna after being forced out of the city in exile in in 1938 um, and wished for London to remain this place that we commemorate Sigmund Freud to commemorate her father um, but of course the the museum in Vienna um, is still standing with a, a whole other kind of perspective you know they've sort of lots of information on the walls, lots of photographs as well um, from Freud's time. And and when when they had just left their home in Vienna, um, in Bergasse, he had invited the photographer Edmund Engelman to go and take photographs of his house in situ in, um, in the sort of... Um, in secret because the Gestapo were watching and he ended up photographing some of the most iconic images of Freud's house and study um, and consulting room uh, that we still sort of turn to today and and compare very much to the way in which he uh, decorated his home in London and and compared to how he decorated it in Vienna. Um, The this aside, Vienna itself is one of the most amazing cities in terms of history and culture and it being the final seat of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. At this time um, of Freud living there, uh, you had great artists uh, producing um, some of the most iconic images of uh, Western European art uh, including 
Gustav Klimt, um, who was developing, um, uh, who was shifting rather from a very uh, academic style of painting, and he was incredibly gifted, and turning it into a slightly more expressionist and abstract style. And from him came the artist Egon Schiele and the artist Oskar Kukoschka, who would go on and further this expressionistic style of painting, which um, which was incredibly influential, I think, for artists, especially today. You can see in the work of um, such as like Tracy Emin, Chantal Joffa, um, the the styles, and um, and oh, who's the other artist? I was saying Jenny Saville, um, who really took this style that Egon Schiele and Oscar Kokoschka, I believe, to um, another level, and um, and I think it's it's a really integral part of art history and important part to see how we got to where we are today with with um particularly with painterly um visually visual arts yeah and gustav Klimt didn't he like lead a secessionist movement to like break artists out of the academy and let them like form their own events and kind of have their own schools of thought and like really trying to get out of the structures that he felt were kind of being oppressive exactly so uh, Klimt actually was hired um in the sort of end of the 19th century along with his brother ernst Klimt, to paint uh, some of the the newly built buildings on the Ringstrasse. This is the, the ring road that sort of um, circles the center of Vienna. Um, and they, the, the city of Vienna had built, the Austrian government had built these new um, municipal buildings all along the Ringstrasse. And they had been invited, these two artists had been invited to paint frescoes, so paintings on the walls, um, and give it a, a, a very kind of academic touch. And after this, he began to really, um, uh, he began to experiment. He became, became very famous as a result and was um, uh, patronized by a lot of the wealthy elite in Vienna. And many of these elite in Vienna were Jewish. Um, I don't include include Freud in this uh, in this elite group, though, however, because Freud was not interested in um, in contemporary art of his time. He was much more conservative with his tastes and he liked Rubens and Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. Um, but Klimt was patronized by these sort of um, wealthy elite in Vienna, many of whom were Jewish patrons. And he began to paint their um, portraits, particularly the wife's portraits. And they began to express this very, he, he began to express in his paintings, this very nervous disposition in their um in their images. So you have this very famous image, which then became a film, The Woman in Gold, um, of Adela Blochbauer. Um, and Adela Blochbauer was the wife of an industrial magnate. And the painting is one of the most expensive paintings in the world. Um, not only, I think not only just because of who it was painted by and, and its significance in history, but also because it is made of pure gold. <laughs> he painted gold leaf almost entirely on the portrait. This painting is now at the, the Neue Gallery in New York. Um, but Klimt's portrait of her, I think, has come under a lot of, um, uh, has, has sort of excited a lot of art historians and um, psychoanalysts and neurologists as well. Um, including, including Eric Candle, um, because of the way in which the the portrait of the woman herself was painted, and her hand, especially at the for in the foreground, her hand is bent in an incredibly unnatural way, and it's suspected that this this portrait was um, uh, evoking a very nervousness in her own character. So this is where I was saying that. Klimt was sort of began to lead the way in in this sort of more expressionist painting and shifting away from the the academic style as 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 you suggested um, earlier. Um, 
because he was no longer interested in just you know an ordinary sitter portrait it was becoming more abstract it was becoming um, symbolic uh, using sort of methods of symbolism and shifting to this internal world in the same way that freud was doing in vienna um, and it, this this tradition was then picked up by his protege egon schiller who um was very interested in the human form and a lot of his sitters looked incredibly emaciated, unwell, but also sexualized. Um, and this creates, I think, an incredibly uncanny, uh, comb uh, uncanny um, evocation because it's these are two things that you maybe don't really want to see together. That it, it, it's really uncomfortable for the viewer. Um, and and despite Egon Schiele's incredible technical mastery, um, he opted to produce these artworks that were far more expressionistic and far more um, <clears throat> abstract than than what the academy was teaching. I mean, interestingly, at this time as well, another you know Egon Schiele was praised at the academy for his technical mastery before he he also seceded later on uh, a few years in um but someone else who was trying to get into the academy at this time in vienna was adolf hitler he was uh, uh and he was trying to get in with his architectural drawings um he applied for several years in a row um and was never admitted and he was living at the YMCA uh, equivalent in in Vienna <laughs> and he would read these sort of cheap tab tabloid newspapers which were spouting very anti-semitic hate which was the zeitgeist of the time and he would he he began to preach and he developed this um I don't know this knack for taking this information he would sort of preach in the ymca to uh his fellow um residents there and and he gathered a following and that's that's sort of the start of of hitler's rising which you know was happening at exactly the same time that freud a jewish psychoanalyst was developing his theories that Gustav Klimt was painting for Jewish patron, patrons. It, Vienna was just a, a melting pot for culture and for ideologies, which I think makes it m the most interesting time and place to be learning about, um, I think particularly today. Yeah, exactly. Um I just what I came to the Freud Museum talk on Wednesday with Van McVolkan on Holocaust Memorial Day. And um, yeah, and the, the director of the Freud Museum, when she did his introduction, talked about how the Freud Museum in London is always trying to make sure to bring these kinds of issues to the fore and talk about immigration and uh, refugees and war and uh, the Holocaust and make sure that's in the forefront. Um, and I think that's really important in psychoanalysis, too, because even the psychoanalytic institutes, at least when I was in training, like it's kind of a side note. It's not really in the forefront and it really needs to be because so many analysts were Jewish and were murdered or had to flee. And um, just this huge rupture and disruption of culture and ideas and like just when like you're saying this is like the heart of like all of this culture is happening all of these ideas are taking root and then this like very destructive force is just trying to like destroy all of it because you know this man's inferiority complex or whatever and it's just like it's just horrendous to think how much yeah how much was destroyed how many people were killed that could never never express their ideas and contribute to society because of you know someone like that. 
Yeah, and it was, um, well, like I said as well, it was the zeitgeist of the time. So the fact that all of this kind of hatred was just openly out there in these very available tabloid newspapers that were just being handed out outside newsstands news or, or whatever, um, he was kind of the product as well of a really um, conflicting society that didn't know who it was or what its identity was. And the um, in Vienna, they, they'd elected a mayor at the end of the 19th century called Karl Lueger, whose values were anti-Semitic. He was um, uh, part of the Christian Socialist Party in Vienna, and he was hugely popular. And um, interestingly, you know, one of the sort of traits that I, I find incredibly uh, fascinating from this period is this notion of um, Jewish people, uh, prominent Jewish figures. Um, I'm thinking specifically of Karl Kraus, the Foyetonist and, and writer. Um, he he was very rejecting of his own Jewish identity. I mean, Freud did it too. Freud was um, not a practicing Jew. He didn't want his wife to practice Judaism either. He um, uh, prevented her from uh, celebrating any of the Jewish holidays. And when he passed away, she brought that back into her life. Um, which is, you know, I think a lot of people have a, a sort of patriarchal view of Freud. I don't think it necessarily was the case. I just think he felt incredibly strongly about his Jewish background. And and it was very much a, a, a component of being brought up in a time where that was not a, um, um, a positive identity to hold. And the... Um, there is this, so there are many accounts, there are many um, articles and research gone into the um, notion that Jewish people really did try to um, uh, eradicate that part of their history and identity from this time period. So um, not only Hitler sort of taking on this uh, anti-Semitic um, persona, but also the Ju the Jewish people of of the period as well, re rejecting that that side of their personality and almost like feeding into that that ideology that it's it's less to be Jewish, which you know is incredibly sad. And um, the uh, excuse me, as I was saying, Karl Kraus. Um, was a, a sort of prolific writer and he he was very kind of polemic in his in his time and he wrote these articles um that were always in high german you know, not not even in the viennese dialect but always high german and he spoke very eloquently and he um you know he associated himself with the germanic identity not with his Jewish identity or his Jewish history and background. Um, no, but I think it's true. This internal internalization is it's really sad. And actually, there's been like three or four times during this chat that I've gotten like well dubbed because oh, no. <laughs> so yeah. But I, it makes me realize how attached I am to Freud <laughs> because when I think of these things, um, yeah, it's just heartbreaking and how his you know his sisters were killed and. It's just heartbreaking, um, and I don't think it's uh, it's upfront enough in, in some in some discourses. You know, I think it's coming up more now, but I think that's because you know we're living through this kind of uh, time again, where people where fascism is on the rise and all over the world. And you know, even though in the United States the last administration is out, you know, like you said, this, this is not about one person. There's like a whole system and a bunch of structures in place that allowed th that to happen. And that's still all in place. So just because you take out one person and put in another person doesn't mean that all of the things that led up to that person rising um, are gone. 
Uh, so there's really like a lot of work and interrogation to do. Yes, exactly. And um, I, I mean, I'm just going to reflect on something back when I was at school, but I was part of something here in the UK called the Holocaust Educational Trust. It was uh, it's something that still continues to happen today, but you you basically invite um, uh, students can apply to be a part of this and you, you become an ambassador for your school and you you visit Auschwitz and you tell your school about this experience that you have and the um, the I remember we, we sort of went around uh, when I was going through through the program and went around and they asked like, you know, why do we do this? And I said, because we want to stop it from happening again. You know, I was kind of very nervous teenager, but we want to stop this from happening again. And the, the, um, I remember the, um, the sort of group leader at the time, she sort of went silent. <laughs> I, I thought that I'd said something stupid, but I actually think that she probably agreed with me. Um, you can't, yeah, it's it's it. This is why I said earlier. You know, it's incredibly important to be learning about this time in history because, not that I'm going to say that it will happen again, that these sort of events are exactly the same, but it is. There are a lot of parallels, and the parallels, almost particularly for the last four years under a certain administration, they seemed very, very similar. In, yeah, the, exactly. in the rhetoric, in the rhetoric. Exactly. Oh, and he fought tooth and nail to the very end, you know, especially with that insurrection there at the end. And, you know, if that if that had worked, we'd be in a whole different situation right now, uh, even people not living over in the U.S. And, uh, yeah, no, it needs to be taken really seriously. And uh, they need, like, Nuremberg-style trials. Um mm -hmm to just show that these things can't happen. These people need to be held accountable before anything worse happens. Because of course, you know, they, they do have concentration camps. They did have all of these camps at the borders um, between like Texas and Mexico, the US and Mexico. And um, they separated all those children from their parents, which is just like, it's just, un it's unconscionable. And yeah, people need to be held accountable for that. Apparently, they're still they're like they're still missing like a thousand children. What? They don't know like where they've been. They've been adopted to people or just like like they they don't like they haven't found them. You know, it's just it's <laughs> insane. What? So it's just like there's just like so much every day that like these things that should be you know huge first priority news at all times are just like they're not because there's so many other things that they've been dealing with. So they really, I hope they make like a task force or a committee just to like deal with all of the issues from that past administration and make sure that people are held accountable because otherwise it's going to be like, um, like when Hitler went to prison for like a year or something and then like wasn't really punished enough and then he ended up coming to power like for real the next time, you know, exactly. so we don't want that. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say one of the one of my um, one of the best things I ever did at the museum was probably one of the smallest events I ever run. It was my very first conference, um, and it was on uh, it, it was alongside an exhibition that we had about for it was marking 80 years since Freud came to to London, um, and it was called um, Leaving Today, and I ran this uh, conference at the end of it. Um, called uh, Freud in Exile and I split the day up between uh, the sort of half the day was the historical so aspect of, of you know refugees and particularly I think particularly coming to London because this was uh, one year after the Brexit um, vote and there was just for for a long time and I suppose even now there's just like a sort of a slightly there's a different air about being in London um, and I really wanted to be a part of something that sort of showed that London was not not this hostile place um, and that you know it was welcoming and I, I really wanted to present that you know the Freuds chose London for a reason um, and 
so I ran this conference and the first sort of three sessions were uh, historical talks looking at the um, the uh, plight of refugees from particularly from the Holocaust coming to London and then the second half of the day was um, was by psychotherapy geopolitics and helping refugees in um, uh, particularly in the in, in out of Syria um, I it, it was an incredibly fascinating day um, and I am incredibly uh, grateful to all of the speakers who came because that talk that day sort of really shaped how I wanted the the Freud Museum or at least the a, a lot of the events that I run to be focused around these um, uh, applying these subjects that applied psychoanalysis to wider sociopolitical issues. And that's why I ended up asking v Vamek Volkan, Dr. Vamek Volkan to speak on Wednesday. I actually, I wrote to him in December asking him, you know, oh, would you be willing to give this talk in, in January for Holocaust Memorial Day? You know, I've read your work extensively. You're one of my heroes. And he, he was honored and he was so delighted. And he said that he'd never spoken at the Freud Museum before. And I kicked myself that I didn't ask him to speak at that conference <laughs> in 2017. Um, but yeah, so it's, uh, and um, I think psychoanalysis can do or can work in so many ways, you know, beyond what psychoanalysis is itself as a practice you know it, I, you learn about it with art history and you can learn about it with socio-political um, conflict and you can apply it to um, all walks of society and I think that's most important um, uh, feature of 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 this practice that Freud created yeah, absolutely. And you, you all had to uh, talk about the um, free clinics as well recently, right? I don't know when it was in this, in this, in this, <laughs> whatever month this has been now. You've had, you've had Elizabeth Danto and you've had talks about uh, the Freud's free clinics and how he wanted people to be able to access this treatment. It wasn't supposed to be what it turned into, at least like in, in the U.S. where it became this kind of elite you know, only people who had time every day to go and, you know, had this kind of money to be able to go every day and that sort of thing could do it. He really wanted it to be more accessible and be more of just a mainstay treatment for mental health. I want it to be like like people think of going to the gym, like you go to the gym multiple times a week to like keep your body healthy and go to analysis multiple times a week to like keep keep your mind healthy and keep working through things. There's always things it's like an ongoing process, I think. Yeah, our most recent conference on um, on free clinics was incredibly um, enlightening. I think really positive to see how the sort of socialist uh, approach to psychoanalysis has been taken up, not just in the UK, but all over the world, and how so many people are trying to make this as accessible as possible. Um, and uh, I had the, we we, had, we invited Elizabeth Danto to come and speak at the museum back in September and I'll, I'll make that talk um, on demand as well um, but she her research all began actually with Anna Freud and Anna Freud you know was Sigmund Freud's youngest daughter but the only child of his that actually took up the the psychoanalytic um, uh, psychoanalysis as a career and she worked almost exclusively with children and in London set up the Hampstead War Nurseries and um, you know helped children help children who were suffering particularly from very traumatic experiences of the Holocaust of the war and who had come to London um, in in uh, in refuge um, as refugees and the Elizabeth Danto had kind of taken that and ended up exploring this sort of cracked the shell open and found that, you know, Freud was doing this as well. Throughout the 1920s, Sigmund Freud created these social clinics and Anna Freud took up her father's very socialist 
endeavors and created um, something that was available for as many people as possible. Um, she also uh, presented a, an exhibition at the Freud Museum a couple years ago called Freud, Tiffany, the Best Possible School, where um, Anna Freud and Dorothy Tiffany Burlingham, her, her colleague, they set up these uh, this school that then um, became quite popular throughout Europe. Um, yeah, I haven't read that book yet. And she did a she did a um, biography, I think, on Anna Freud as well. Somebody did a biography on Anna Freud. It was uh, Elizabeth Young Brule wrote. A, That's who it was. Yeah, um, but you know, interestingly, Elizabeth Danto, her background, I think, was in um, she was uh, like a social care worker or something. And and that's how she came into into sort of learning about the history of psychoanalysis was through Anna Freud and then through Sigmund Freud. I, I it's usually the other way around. <laughs> yeah, I love that though. That's great. That's why I love that. Like I said before, I love that there's so many different routes into psychoanalysis, and then it can be applied the other way in so many different directions. And like like you pointed out with like Dr. Volkan's work. Um, he uses it like in practice and he meets with leaders of different countries that are having difficulties communicating and, and working with each other. And he's trying to really like use psychoanalytic ideas and techniques to like help facilitate discuss discussion between groups um, and political parties that haven't been able to really speak to one another um, because there is so much history and so many different traumas. Um, so he applies like this idea of like transgenerational transmission of traumas and like understanding these kind of old wounds to help facilitate speech in the present with groups, not just between individuals. I think that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, one of the questions that came out from uh, one of the questions that emerged in the Q&A um, after his talk was, you know, how how do you how do you heal? after this because it's it's such a burden on it, I'd imagine such a burden on the individual to have to you know try and repair these massive um, uh, problems that exist within societies and he was so humble he just said I just like to go into nature <laughs> and spend time with my grandkids yeah, he said when he was on the podcast, he says his house is like really remote now and he just like lives in the forest and that sounds perfect. Incredible. That's what you do. You go to the yeah. forest. <laughs> are you in the middle of Stockholm? <laughs> yeah, we are. But we're actually talking about buying a house and moving into the forest. So. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, well, might as well just become totally isolated. So live in northern Sweden where this like you know, 10 feet of snow. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Right now we live right near the central station. So it's pretty, it's pretty idea when, when we used to travel, we could literally like walk less than five minutes to the central station and get on a train anywhere. But uh, that doesn't seem to matter anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Um, I was going to say that, um, you know, another one of kind of like my, my whole highlights of working at the Freud Museum was um, a conference that I ran with my colleague Stefan Mariansky back in 2018. And this was a huge conference called Freud Lynch Behind the Curtain. Did you did you come for that? No, but I, I heard of it. You heard of it. It um it was so much fun. So we worked with uh, a venue. Um, we, we held it outside of the Freud Museum because we wanted a much bigger space and we wanted a kind of cinematic setting to honor David Lynch um, in this way. And we ended up holding it at the Rio Cinema, which is an art deco cinema uh, listed building here in London. And they'd created this atmosphere that when people walk in, the t Twin Peaks theme tune was playing and they'd put, uh, I think they'd put chevrons on the floor. <laughs> it, was, it was the most amazing experience. And then you walk into the cinema space itself, which, you know, is this, as I said, like an art deco cinema. It's got this sort of red velvet uh seating and red velvet curtains that pull back to reveal the screen and we spent two days 
at this place with about 400 people and it was one of the best experiences I've ever had at an event and and such wonderful feedback and attendees from all over the world from Sweden to Korea to um, California <clears throat> all visiting just for this particular event and um, sadly David Lynch did not come himself we were very we tried but it didn't work <laughs> and we we are actually about to release all of the talks from that on our website so as sort of as as short films um, isolating each talk um, so if you wanted to if anybody wanted to catch up and if they missed any of those, I highly recommend popping over to our website in the next couple of weeks to check those out. Um, the conference itself, the papers are going to be published in a book. Um, we just, uh, it, it's um, been delayed slightly because of the pandemic, but we're, we're getting back on it. Very cool. No, absolutely. I highly recommend everything I've seen through the Fred Museum London has been great. Oh, thanks. <laughs> There's yeah, they've all been they're all like top notch, top notch talks and events, and really creative, like you said, and like I think very accessible. So like even people that are into psychoanalysis per se, like with Mary's projection series, you know, you're into film, and then you get kind of psychoanalytic uh, education and information through this other kind of aspect, whether it's the arts or film, or so I think that's great as well. Many avenues. Yes, I hope so. I hope so. I hope brought together by the fact that like, you know, we're a tiny team, there's about 15 of us, and we all come from different uh, disciplines, you know, philosophy, um, psychoanalysis itself, history, art history, and, and art. Um, and we've kind of brought it together to create, and Jewish studies as well, and we've all brought it together to create this, like, I don't know, amalgam of, of um, ideas and and um, ways of looking at psychoanalysis and ways of looking at Freud. Yeah, I think that really shows. It keeps it really dynamic and like vibrant that you do have all these different perspectives. Because if it was just analysts running the Freud Museum, it would probably <laughs> be really dull, to be honest. <laughs> it would end up like an institute, you know, just like... <laughs> yeah somehow, somehow groups of psychoanalysts we love to like deaden things which I don't understand because it's so antithetical to the theory but somehow that's what happens when we end up in groups so <laughs> so it's great it's great that there's people coming from all sides <laughs> Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Jamie Roars. For more, please visit the Freud Museum London online at freud.org.uk and check out their shop as well as What's On for on-demand and live stream courses and lectures. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. From Chapart Books, 2019. For more, please visit our publisher's website, chapart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash V-A-N-E-S-S-A two three C-A-R-L. Your support is greatly appreciated. For more information, you can also visit my website, drvanessasinclair.net or the podcast main website, Rendering Unconscious org. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. She is
is a vessel for such spirits, and strong dead of both of lineage and of adoption. Symposium, recitation of Shakespearean about society. Two other picks are of the old burrows declared this the best. Congolese magic is unparalleled. History we have breaks from each other. Believe in any space. So when we re-enter the scene, return or anywhere really, it's fine. The spirits just don't like pee and fuck in the pool. gender identity, distinguish between walking and the, and the presence and assertion of symptoms and functions, so that period, so that restlessness that lasts, fact be associated with, under the tutelage of mist, gods and go to God, the, the sun god is the ruler, sense, We'll have landscapes. You're about to practice sexual nature. Sexuality preceding the eye. One grappling with sexuality with ones. But when I fill the psychoanalytic snakes and lemon balm, contain the small, out to perform a ritual or attend the next program, we're cutting ourselves out of our. To honor my lineage with another of identity, just more so to honor my lineage. The apocryphal back and change hour, whose object, a biological, first rays of movement, physical before we reproduction, and succession which links. 